In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation this morning. And as always, it's great to be with all of you. We'd like to start off our conversation, as always, by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many wonderful titles. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We would like to invite Mary to be with us. Also, I pray that prayer at the end of the rosary, and the prayer is called the Hail Holy Queen. I'd like to invoke Mary also as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's, uh, on February 11th, we celebrate the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes. Let's turn to Mary and help us, to ask her to help us in our many struggles that all of us are going through now. That we would have recourse to Mary, knowing that her prayers are very powerful. As we say, the prayer that she loves most, and that's the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to pray for our spiritual direct uh, invite our spiritual director to to accompany us our spiritual director is the holy spirit holy spirit has many wonderful titles holy spirit is known as the paraclete holy spirit is also known as the Gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. I'd like to pray also for Holy Spirit is also known as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. If that were not enough, the Holy Spirit is also our spiritual teacher. St. Paul goes on to say that we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means daddy or father. So let's pray to the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light in our intellect and the fire of love to burn within our hearts. As we say, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, 
pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So my friends, in Jesus, Mary, and Joseph today, I will be praying for all of you. And as they celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass today, I'd like to place all of you on the altar. Of course, the greatest prayer in the whole world is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to place all of you on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I'd like to offer these specific intentions. First of all, that all of us would make a concerted effort to be open to the Holy Spirit. Our sanctification, our sanctification depends upon, my friends, our being open and docile to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. So perhaps we can say this prayer often today. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My next intention, I'd like to pray for all of your families, our families, that our family members would draw closer to God. In fact, only God can give us true happiness. Only God can give us true and authentic, authentic happiness. So I'd like to pray that our family members would not seek their happiness in the things of this world, but rather in God himself. My third intention will be, this very day, people will be dying. The moment we die is the most important moment in our life. The moment we die will determine our eternal destiny, meaning where will we go and remain for all eternity, either salvation or condemnation, there's no other place. So I pray that those who will, who will be dying today, those who will be dying today, will obtain a holy and happy death. They'll obtain a holy and happy death. That despite our many sins, that we would have great trust in God's infinite mercy. Let's pray also that we would have a holy and happy death ourselves. Nothing more important than getting to heaven. May God help us to arrive at, at our eternal destiny, which is to contemplate 
the beatific vision of God for all eternity. So, as they often do, I'd like to start off with some some reflection that can help us to set the tone of the day. Today is the feast day of St. Valentine, who was actually a martyr for the faith. And traditionally in this day is the feast day of St. Valentine. It's the day, the day, so to speak, of lovers. But I'd like to give you a a Catholic interpretation of St. Valentine's Day of Lovers. This is a day in which we could we can it's a day also when people give each other cards with heart with like cards with hearts on it. The day of lovers can be this for us. The day in which we seek our refuge in two hearts. Let us seek a refuge in the Immaculate Heart of Mary and in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So for us, Valentine's Day can be interpreted as the day of the two hearts of Jesus and Mary. With respect to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, let's seek refuge in the Immaculate Heart of Mary by consecrating yourself to Mary, by praying to Mary, by offering Mary a rosary because every time we say the Hail Mary, we're really saying, Mary, I love you as my mother. Now, how can we show our great love to the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Well, this can be done by coming to visit the Church and the Blessed Sacrament. Pope St. John Paul II said that the tabernacle, the tabernacle is the living heartbeat of Christ. The tabernacle is the living heartbeat of Christ. So Jesus in his sacred heart, this day of lovers, invites us with these words. Come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary. and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So by you going to visit our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, You want to go, kneel down, and say, Lord, I love you. Grant me the grace to love you more and more.
Lord, I love you, but grant me the grace to love you more and more. And my friends, when all is said and done, the only thing that really matters in our lives is that we love God and we die loving God, having the love of God within our hearts. When all is said and done, that's the only thing that really matters. If we die loving God, we die having the love of God in our hearts, then we will love God for all eternity in heaven. Another way in which we can live out this day of lovers, St. Valentine's Day, can be this, not only to visit the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, whereas John Paul II says that's the loving heartbeat of Christ within the church is the Blessed Sacrament, the Tabernacle. But also to, as I said yesterday in my talk, my Monday talk on the liturgy, the sacred liturgy in the Mass, is to go to Mass. To go to Mass and to participate fully, actively, and consciously in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and being in the state of grace, to receive the Eucharist with faith, devotion, and love. To receive the Eucharist with faith, devotion, and love. Years ago, Years ago, I had this thought. When I arrived here in California, there was a young man that had to have a heart transplant. And it happened a good more than 25 years ago. Now, now this young man lives in Texas with his parents and he's he would probably be in his 40s. He had a successful, he had a successful heart transplant. Now we, we can have a successful heart transplant. Every time we receive Holy Communion with love, that's, my friends, that's very true. In this sense, we're talking about the Day of Lovers in honor of St. Valentine. Every time you receive Holy Communion, in the state of grace, of course, you receive the whole Christ. When I say the whole Christ, I mean the total Christ would be you receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So in the body of Christ, in the human body, the two most noble parts of the human body is the intellect as well as the will, the mind and the heart. So every time you receive Holy Communion, you receive also the, the sacred heart of Jesus, which we can see on my studio wall, the sacred heart of Jesus. There you can see it, the sacred heart of Jesus. So you receive the sacred heart of Jesus beating within your hearts. So beg the Immaculate Heart of Mary to give you the grace to receive Holy Communion with greater and greater devotion and love. Of all the actions, 
of all the actions that we can carry out in our lives. Of all the actions that we can carry out in our lives, there's nothing greater than going to Mass and receiving Holy Communion, but with love. In fact, your salvation and my salvation depends on that. Jesus says this categorically, with unequivocally he says our salvation depends on that in these words from John chapter 6. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. So my friends, this is the day of lovers. Let us go to the ultimate source of love, the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. May we love, well, may, may we try to live out the greatest of all the commandments, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And may we love our neighbor as we do love ourselves. My friends, this also is a day in which we celebrate two saints at the same time. These saints lived in the 800s, the 9th century. Their name is Cyril and Methodius. They lived in the 1800s, and both Cyril and Methodius were brothers. Cyril was the oldest brother of seven, and Methodius was the younger brother of seven, and they're both saints. They were proclaimed by Pope John Paul II as the co-patrons of Europe with St. Benedict. They evangelized the Slavic nations. I'd like to give you a, a summary of John Paul II's visit to Santiago Compostelo. Maybe some of you have done Il Camino in Santiago Compostelo, Spain. In honor of these two great saints who were known for the evangelization of, of, of Europe, Eastern Europe, When John Paul II went to Barcelona, Spain, at the early part of his pontificate, he made this, this proclamation to the people at Spain that Europe, Europe, which was the seat of Christianity, known as Christendom. Europe was actually known as Christendom before it had the name Europe. It was a series of countries united basically in Christian values. Spain and France and Germany and Italy and Portugal in Eastern Europe, Poland, Czechoslovakia. 
it took possibly a thousand years to really form Christian Europe. And you really cannot talk about Europe without talking about its roots in Christianity. And John Paul II praised Europe for its Christian values, love for life, love for family, the pursuit of peace, the pursuit of justice, the defense of the human person, deep-rooted love for God, love for neighbor, these were, these have been, the Christian roots of, of Europe. But John Paul II said that Christianity in Europe is basically in crisis. We're talking but probably about 40 years ago. Christianity in Europe is in crisis, pointing to not simply a paganism, but a neo-paganism is spreading, pervading Europe, as well as, we might say, the United States. And many of our forefathers actually came from Europe. Now what is present? in modern Europe and in America. There's a certain neo-paganism, a secularism, a rampant spread of materialism, an aggressive attack on human life, the legalization of abortion in many countries in Europe. On the other side of the spectrum, you also have the legalization and promotion of euthanasia. The loss of family values and the loss of the respect for the sacrament of holy matrimony, wherein couples are starting to, to live together without pursuing the recept preparation and reception for holy matrimony. So John Paul II made an urgent appeal in Santiago Compostelo in Spain for the present generation, the younger generation to re-evangelize, to, to re-evangelize Europe. To re-evangelize Europe. And I would have to say even the same thing about the United States, to re-evangelize the United States. building upon the teaching of John Paul II. The call to be a missionary. I'd like to mention to you, my friends, because we're trying to cultivate our minds. We're trying to cultivate our, our theological foundations. I'd like to mention some documents on ev the evangelization of Europe, but by means of the some of the missionary documents in the church. 
we go back 60 years ago, the, the Second Vatican Council has a document on missionary activity. And the name of that document, the missionary document, would be that of Ad Gentis. Now this is from Vatican II. So if you want to read an ecclesial document on missionary activity agentis, which means to the people. The last words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ before ascending to heaven were the following. He said to the disciples and the apostles, go out to all nations. Teach them all I taught you. And baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. So the last words of Christ were a missionary, a missionary mandate. So let's build upon this. Let's build upon this. There's Pope Paul the Sixth that wrote a document in the name of that document of Pope Paul the Sixth was Ava. Evangelium Nunciandi. My friends, what we're talking about is honoring Saint Valentine, Saint Cyril, Cyril and Methodius. Is that Europe has to be re-evangelized and the United States has to be re-evangelized. We are living in a society of neo-paganism. That's right. We're living in a society of neo-paganism where in Europe and the United States we're losing our Christian roots. Even the United States was, was built on the desire for religious liberty. It's a Judeo-Christian society. This country was based on that. But we are losing our roots also. So I'm giving you a more intellectual approach today, and I'm giving you a series of documents. Agentes would be the document from the Second Vatican Council on missionary activity throughout the world. Asia Evangelii Nunciandi by Pope St. Paul VI. I just, uh, in these documents, I'd like to just give you an idea, then you can read the whole document at leisure. Paul VI insists also on the call to missionary work throughout the world. And what does he say? One idea I'd like to glean from Evangeli Nunziandi is Paul the Sixth says this. He says that the world today is full of a lot of words, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts. Speaks about also the cacophony of strident protests. Paul the Sixth. Then Paul the Sixth says in this document, "What the world needs more than anything else are saints. The saints are the best missionaries. The saints are the best evangelists." The saints are the best teachers 
the saints are the best catechists. So if we want to become like Saint Cyril and Methodius and Saint Valentine and like John the 23rd and Paul the 6th and Francis Xavier, we want to be a good missionary, then all of us have to strive in our lives. Strive in our lives to become the saint that God has called us to be. And as a famous writer said, the greatest tragedy in our lives is not to become the saint that God has called us to become. Quoting once again Vatican II, Vatican II, which would be Lumen Gentium Chapter Chapter 5 That is the universal call to holiness. Lumen, Jap Lumen Gentium Chapter 5 is the universal call to holiness. So, building upon our theological and ecclesial conversation today, if indeed we want to be successful missionaries, then we all have to pursue holiness of life. And this is going to come about, my friends, when we're faithful to striving to go deeper and deeper in our prayer life. One of the greatest missionaries and the greatest missionaries last century was Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Venerable Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen and he insisted, my friends, upon the holy hour, the hour of power. So that's one idea from Evangelion Nunciandi of Pope St. Paul VI. The world is tired of a lot of, a lot of words. The, the world wants to see saints, and you're called to become that saint. As our Lord says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. So what I'm doing today, I'm giving you a mini course in ecclesiology today in honor of St. Cyril and Methodian. And they were the patrons of Europe with St. Benedict. So well, let's go to the great John Paul II. His missionary document was Missio Redemptoris. You're going to become Latin scholars by the end of the class today because the, the documents are first written in Latin. So you're going to become Latin scholars, aren't you? Latin scholars. Okay, so Missio Redentoris is the missionary encyclical of John Paul II. And I would say, my friends, talking about the evangelization of Europe, John Paul II John Paul II would be one of the greatest missionaries we've ever had. I invite all of you to try to go deep in your study because I'm just quoting these documents from memory. God has given me a good memory, thanks be to God, and the ability to retain a lot of what I study. You, you pray for the same thing, that you'll be able to communicate with others the abundance of the Catholic faith. So let me give you then just a brief, a brief summary of John Paul II, 
missionary document, and then I'll move into Pope Francis. So I'm giving you a summary of the past 60 years, the missionary documents. What do you think? John Paul II, without a doubt, was the greatest missionary last century. With him would be Mother Teresa of Calcutta, And with Mother Teresa Calcutta, we would have, once again, our friend, Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Three of the key luminary missionaries of past century. So John Paul II, Missio Redden taught us, says this, that from our baptism, we're all called to be missionaries. That's right. From our baptism, we're all called to be missionaries. Because once baptized, you were anointed with holy chrism. That's right. And you are anointed to be a priest, a prophet, and a king. Priest, you're called to offer up sacrifices. King, you were called to dominate our passions and to be of service to others. As Jesus said, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and give his life in ransom for many. And prophet is someone who announces the good news to the whole world. John Paul II, in his document, Missio Redentoris, he says this, that the world, especially Europe, the Christianized countries, can be divided into three classes of people. Those who have never, those who have never heard the kerygma the preaching, the teaching, the proclamation of the good news. Many, many have never heard it. Many have never heard it. Then, there's a second group of those who have heard the Word of God but have hunger for a greater growth in their faith, and that's you people. You've heard the Word of God, you've accepted the Word of God, and you're really trying to live out the Word of God, and you're called to be the modern missionaries. You are. You're called to be the modern missionaries. God is waiting for you. He's waiting for me. He's waiting for you, too. The harvest is rich, the labors are few. But the third group, and this is the group that we have to go after. The biggest religious group in Europe, the biggest religious group In the Philippines, the biggest religious group in Mexico, the biggest religious group in Brazil, the biggest religious group in South, Central, in Latin America are Catholics, 
but non-practicing Catholics. That's some of the concepts of John Paul II in his missionary document, Missio, Missio Redentoris. Missio Redentoris. That's right. Missio Redentoris. Missio Redentoris. Then John Paul II says this. What do you think, or where do you think, my friends, would be the, the greatest missionary field of work or territory? What do you think? John Paul II says that the biggest territory for missionary activity in the world are, my friends, the big cities. In the United States, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, but also the biggest diocese in the United States is where I am right now, Los Angeles. The harvest, the harvest is rich but the laborers are all too few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers to work in his vineyard. Beatriz Sanchez has put it in, in other words, falling, fallen away Catholics. Catholics that were baptized, they made their first communion, they made their confirmation, but they've fallen by the wayside. So it's, a, it, so it's incumbent, it's incumbent upon us in honor of St. Cyril and Methodius who suffered very much to re-evangelize where we are. And of course, as Martha has pointed out, we want to start with our own family, which is known as the, the domestic church. So I'm giving you a whole list of ecclesial theological documents of the church on missionary activity. And I'd like to give you one by Pope Francis which is an excellent document, and it's called The Joy of the Gospel. This is one of the first documents of Pope Francis, The Joy of the Gospel. It's very, very rich. And I'd like to just point out two of the basic ideas that Pope Francis has. The first, he says, is that unfortunately Unfortunately, Pope Francis says,
we do dedicate time and effort to helping out the poor. We have social services and government policies to help out the poor, which is very good. Because Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a foreigner and you welcomed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. When? Whenever we did it to the least of our brothers, then we did it to Christ. But Pope Francis says, unfortunately, we sometimes neglect to feed the minds and the hearts and the souls of the people with the Word of God. In the words of Jesus himself, Jesus said, to Satan. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then in this encyclical of Pope Francis, The Joy of the Gospel. Pope Francis says that by preaching the gospel, we have to preach the gospel motiv motivated by the joy of Christ. If individuals. There are many individuals today that are in a severe state of sadness, desolation, I'd even say a state of, of depression. If they can see someone like you, someone like you, or I'm viewed, with the joy of the gospel. If you are imbued and permeated by the joy of the gospel that's overflowing by your by your poise, by your being, by who you are, by the way you live, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you compose yourself, that person will say that you have something that they don't have. You have the joy that comes from the gospel. The joy that comes from the gospel. So what I've done today, my friends, in our perseverance conversation, honoring St. Valentine, the day of lovers in which the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary are our true lovers. I've also spent my, talk, my, my conversation with you talking about St. Cyril and Methodius who are the co-patrons of Europe with St. Benedict. Expounding upon the call, my friends, to evangelize. The call to preach. We've arrived, my friends. Europe used to be called Christendom. The United States had its, has its roots in Judeo-Christian values. We have returned, my friends, to a neo-paganism. 
So I've given you a series of church ecclesiastical documents on the call to be missionaries. Let's beg the Blessed Virgin Mary who Mother Teresa of Calcutta who founded the Missionaries of Charity. Mother Teresa of Calcutta presented Mary in this light. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said Mary was the first missionary of charity. Because after saying yes to Christ, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to their word. Then Mary went as a missionary of charity to bring the good news of Christ to others. So in the midst of so much paganism, secularism, and confusion, let us pray that we would be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and the bright city on the top of the mountain. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.